Get your heart to your trust. Well, there's my, this is my, my own thing, so I got it in Aheji. You know what Aheji is? Aheji is in uh, Japan, uh, north of uh, Kyoto, north west of Kyoto. And that's the monastery that Dogen founded. The great, uh, the great Zen master Dogen. And um, he founded a Heiji. I guess people are still coming in. So I wait a minute and I'll tell you the story. And then uh, what I love about him is that on his way there, looking for a place to make a new monastery from Kyoto area, I think. He was intercepted by an emissary of the Shogun. So that, that was like the recent time of Shogun, I think, 13th or 14th century. I'm not quite sure. And uh, maybe a little later. And uh, that emissary invited him to come with his uh, Sangha community and have a special monastery in Edo, which is now Tokyo. Uh, sort of imperial, you know, but not imperial, because Shogun usurped the power, really, of the emperor. And they were just a warlord. And so he politely declined, said they weren't ready, and they had to do more for forest meditation, a more remote monastery. And, and sent a, 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 you know, to his written you know, charter of him to go and have a big, huge uh, funded monastery by the government. And he declined, and then he sent a polite decline. And then, after the guy left, the emissary, he had his disciples take the chair that the emissary had sat in and chop it into pieces and burn it on the, on the ground where it had, because it was like a camp, you know. And then he had the ground where the chair had sat and where he burned it dug down like almost a meter deep and threw the ashes and the dirt itself into the stream. Just to kind of show the disciples he wasn't going to be tempted. <laughs> I really like that. It shows like that he was aware of, you know, the, the society, you know, and that these people always have been, you know, in Buddhist history, you know. Imagine what a what a what a ritual, you know, of like, no, I'm not tempted by the imperial or the shogun's, you know, demand, you know, I'm gonna refuse it. I'm gonna get it right instead. I really like that. And there were no consequences for It's kind of a confusion thing too. Okay. So everyone's here, everyone's going to be here? Yes, we've got your sutra. Now we're going to do this like they do in the, uh, let me see. Okay, I, use that. I, I should have a wooden fish to tap out the rhythm. We're going to chant it, okay? Syllable by syllable, okay, you've got it? In the, in the Zen way, the way they do it. Of course, it's easier with Chinese characters because there's one character, you know, color and alphabet, but you'll see. Allen Ginsberg told us to do this, but it's a Zen thing, okay? Are you ready? In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pradhaparamita Hirdaya Sutra in Tibetan Pondene Matera Parti. Oh, in English, the blessed may be Buddha, heart of transcendent wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the blessed Lord traveling on the vulture peak at Rajasura together with great company. Unity, the mendicant and bodhisattva at that time. The blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi for illumination of the profound, the standard noble body. Tatva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendent wisdom. The Mantra that you find body, mind, thought, and in the void of any intrinsic reality thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputta, addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. The great hero, not when any noble time wishes to engage in the 
practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom. How should he learn then the noble body of Atma Avalokiteshvara, the great hymn? Address venerable Saragati Buddha, the charming Buddha, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it. This way, those five body mind processes should be truly realized. Void of any intrinsic reality, matter is voidless. Voidless is matter. Voidless is not other than matter. Matter other than voidness, likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Charlie Buddha, thus all things are voidless, timeless, uncreated, unseen, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Charlie Buddha, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensations, no conceptions. No mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no media, from eye to mentality, sense media. There are no consciousness media, from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no sensation of ignorance and so on. To no old age and death, and no sensation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no sensation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment either. Therefore, Charlie Buddha, because of all this suffering, is without attainment. She lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. Her spirit is unobscured and free of fear, passing far beyond all confusion. She ultimately succeeds in nirvana, and all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddha, for in unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of good science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as true, the transcendent wisdom mantra, as follows by the Akhapunjante Gatte, Parajate, Parasamjate, Bodhiswara, Prikasum Gatte, Gatte, Parajate, Parasamjate, Bodhiswara, Ungatte, Gatte, Parajate, Parasamjate, Bodhiswara, Learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom. Just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the Blessed Lord has spoken thus, the Venerable Saradati Buddha, the Noble Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience, and the whole world with its God's human sight and sincerity, rejoice and all applaud in what the Buddha said. And then in transition, you say in your mind, any negative spirit present, be gone, and you clap three times. <laughs> Which just seals the deal. You see, as long as whenever he does any teaching at all, even if he's not teaching the transcendent, the Heart Sutra, as it's famously called, he recites it before any teaching automatically. Because any kind of negative spirit lurking around leaves because they hate it, they don't like it. They, they, they're really upset by it. 
but then you do traps in there. And then this is the thing, it's very close to traffic is with uh, Angel Siding Demon. So when the British invaded Tibet in 1904, after they shot down the Gatling guns, oh. about seven, 8,000 Tibetans up in the pass, they got to Lhasa, and the Tibetans were lined up on the streets clapping. <laughs> so the Brits were surprised. They said, oh, they're happy we came. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't realize it was the last ditch Tibet. <laughs> and it didn't work, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, they didn't leave. <laughs> but actually, the leader of the expedition, I'm sorry, I'm sniffling into a song on that. The leader of the expedition became, had a vision in Tibet while he was imposing an Asi reparation treaty on the Tibetans for having resisted his invasion. And uh, like Young Husband, his name was, Colonel Young Husband. And then he founded an institution for world peace back in London when he went back uh, later. And the treaty he imposed on the Tibetans, the British didn't honor anyway. But anyway, that was 1904. Okay. So now. I've been thinking about Frederica, what you asked about where to start, and another way of answering it. And so what I thought I would say is, well, one starts by learning, as I think I did say. But then within learning, there are certain themes that are general in Buddhism, which are organized in a work, um, various works by various masters in different forms, to sort of, to what is considered the sort of most comprehensive one is what's something called Lam Rim Chemo, the great stages of the path of enlightenment, written by Tsongkhapa in 1404, something like that, 1403, about five years after he, his full enlightenment, and uh, 1498. And then there's a very short version, and that's like three volumes in English, a translation of it, many four or five hundred pages in Tibetan. And uh, then, the, but then there's one that's only 12 verses and it's short formed also. And, um, but the first theme in that, and this is a place to start, is to, is having it sort of in the realistic worldview level. And that is, what do you think you are? Not who, but what? What is a human being? And here, you know, Carl Sagan, in his cosmos that some of you, uh, a little bit elder people will remember, uh, he used to have one of those shows in that one, was where he's walking on a cosmic calendar, an evolutionary calendar, you know, and he gets to like, you know, 11 p.m. on the final day of the month, you know, the cosmic month, and then the human beings begin to evolve, and then they know that this and that. And then he goes on about how amazing the shoulder joint is, what an amazing thing it is, and this tailless monkey who walks around on Earth and then makes all these wonderful inventions or whatever, <clears throat> and looks for life on other planets and this kind of thing. So he goes on about how amazing, what an amazing thing a human being is. But of course, to him, it's amazing because it's a genetic, species-evolved thing. It's just like a mechanism, really, because there's no soul in there and no spirit. He, well, because he's, fight, he's fighting a bunch of fundamentalist fanatics, creationists, you know, in Arkansas, who want to teach Genesis, creationism, you know, along with Darwin, and they're still fighting against Darwin, at least as being even relevant, because they don't want to be related to monkeys, they don't want to be related to people of other races and so on. So, you know, he, he considers them like unpleasant characters, and he, he's holding the line for science, you know, and he thinks the only way to do that is to be material. So he has a good motivation. But think about it. You, are you just this piece of genetic mechanism, machinery? Or are you just a piece of biological machinery? Part of which, you know, you're like you're like in the matrix in a way already. You, 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 you think you're not in a vat, in a giant battery, like Neo was, remember? He was like a uh, like an embryo, like a giant battery, remember? And then he 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 took the pill. The matrix person took the red pill, and then suddenly he was there, and he was conscious there, and then the machine came and saw that he was conscious of where he was, and then they jumped him into the sewer. And luckily, the Neo people were there, and they grabbed him out, remember? Mm -hmm. So we we're in a kind of matrix also. Because we're told that we're just this mechanism, a genetic mechanism, a biological machine, and part of what keeping us active to carry these genes, who are the real masters of the universe, 
And they want to go somewhere, right? They want more people like us. And so they tell us to go do all these different things, you know, fall in love, have a profession, you know, you know, you know, have like many, maybe, maybe scatter many seeds, many places to have more people, you know. It's just a mechanism, species mechanism. We're just, we, we don't, we're not actually there. But part of getting us to do the job of carrying the genes is make us think we are there, which is an illusion because we're not really, we're really nothing. And we return to what we really are just by dying. After we've dumped our genes, then we start to decay and get old like me and then die. And that's it. So we're, so we're just a matrix. We're just running around and we're really just a mechanism, supposedly. No wonder we're all depressed. <laughs> It's pointless, and it has no point anyway, because it is an accident. Some weird rock blew up, and then the small fire went this, and somebody did a big bang, and then the rock fell, and then the moon broke off, and then this and that and the other, and then it balanced the water, et cetera, et cetera. It just happens to look like the same size as the sun, but never mind, it's this amazing accident, and all these constant constants, you know, these numbers exactly this way, that way, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the lungs and fire. <laughs> it's so amazing, but it's just an accident and it's meaningless and purposeless. And maybe that's the only place it ever happened. And who cares anyway? Because we're all going to be nothing because we are nothing. How's that for being in a matrix? Just a robot. Bunch of robots. So we only go on retreat or go to a yoga center because we might meet somebody that our genes like. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So then, how do you get it? You take the what's the red pill? <laughs> the red pill is maybe you're you, and you really are you in a relative, really, relatively, really are you, and maybe what you do ethically, and mentally, and verbally, and physically will determine your own personal evolution, and you might hop from species to species yourself. The bodies are yes, a bunch of genes, and they have all these different things. And you, and you, but somehow, instead of living happily like a hippopotamus floating around in the upper Nile and munching down some hapless guy who came by in a canoe, because <laughs> he was annoying you when you were down there in your hippopotamus, you know, they're pretty fierce hippopotamus, you know, that big, you know. Instead of that, you like the guy in the canoe. You said, gee, that guy, he's in a canoe. He can get out of a canoe. He can go over there and do this and that. Suddenly, and of course, you didn't think it through. You didn't write a poem about him. But you sort of thought maybe that's nice to be like that. More free than just sit hippopotamizing here in the river. And slowly, slowly, you moved up that way. And there's a very a fun story that I like about Vasubandhu who was the younger brother of the great Asanda, the guy who met the dog and then went with Maitreya. Mm -hmm. brother was a super scholar, he was a half-brother of him, different father, same mother. And he, and his brother wanted him to become Mahayanas. So he gave him a giant bunch of books and sutras and things. And then Vasubandhu, and, and out of filial piety for his elder brother, Vasubandhu felt he should read them. So he got in a, in a vat, he had a bathtub, I don't know how he had such a bathtub, but he had a bathtub filled with sesame, warm sesame oil where he would sit and read all these sutras. And he had a parrot, and the parrot heard him read all the sutras. And then the parrot was reborn as a human and became a great <laughs> pundit in his next life from listening to them. The parrot did, they have a story like that. So there are sometimes some real jumps upward, and unfortunately, People like Hitler and Stalin and Lenin, mass murderers, Jeffrey Dahmer, they will, they can jump way down even they have most dreadful hells. I mean, really scary stuff. Even Buddha forbid monks to meditate on them without meditating on some other thing because they would make them too depressed. So, <coughs> so when you're out of the matrix, you suddenly, you're not in a metal submarine under the ocean, but you're suddenly responsible for what's going to happen. And then you yourself will reap the consequences of your deeds and actions. And you yourself are responsible and you will not get away from your connections with other people. If you're harmful to someone else, they'll come back at you. You know, you get into this interwoven infinite relativity weave. And furthermore, from ancient times, these uh, people in India 
we're fully aware of millions, zillion other planets where there are other human beings. There are various kinds of what we might call angel or divinity type beings, and huge complicated planes of, of being. And um, so it wasn't like an accident, and it wasn't this and that, and it's beginningless and endless. And the key, and the key point is, what are you? And there, then you suddenly realize, <coughs> realize when you take that red pill, you wake up out of being a, an involuntary, instinct-driven, impulse-driven mechanism, running around being this plane that's carrying genes, but really for no purpose, no point, no spirit, no soul, no future life. And so what the hell, you know? Why bother type of thing? It's, it's actually logical, on, if that was real. Mm -hmm. And I've already gone into how there's no nothing and everything, so I won't, I won't belabor that, but I'm saying, then what are you is you are the result of choices you made as other kinds of animals. <coughs> I'm sorry. If you were, you have been gods, actually, an angel of yourself like the equivalent of what we would think of as magical beings, but you realize that those very long lives that you lived in those realms, you became too complacent and you didn't really develop and you weren't sensitive and vulnerable enough to others. So you ended up kind of not caring about what was going on. You, know, you were like living in some penthouse and you just did everybody else was like ants to you. Except maybe some other gods or godlings and you partied around for a while, but you kind of wasted your time. And then when you were in lower states, where you're kind of really living in subsistence, survival sort of mode, and they call it eat or be eaten, the animal kingdom. One eating another. And when I meditated on this first, when I was this, first in this life, and when I was like 21 or something, my teacher at one point used to periodically send me to my mother's apartment in New York, just to sort of touch base with reality, with the ordinary social reality of America. I remember once I'd been meditating on this, and I happened to turn on the TV, uh, and I saw The Living Desert by Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that kind of movie, but it's like one tarantula jumps on a wasp, and then a snake grabs a tarantula, and, it, and if you're sort of in a very sensitive state for having meditated, you kind of <laughs> identify with each creature, and then uh, you get eaten, uh, and the next one eats the next one. It's really so it was a real illustration of anyonya bhakshana, one devouring another. You know. And then there are worse states even than that, which I won't get into. And then in those states, what they are really is crystallization of the second noble truth, me versus my environment. Because you, you, know, you might think that if you have an armadillo with like armored scales, you know, when you're in the dreamlike between states and you see a body that seems well armored, and it's hard for some another one to bite it. That might be an attractive form of life. So you head toward that egg or whatever it is, you know, toward that female armadillo who's going to lay eggs. I guess they lay eggs. Or maybe they are mammals. I'm not sure about armadillo. Whatever, crocodile. And you you might be attracted to that because you're feeling paranoid. You, you don't want to be some soft-skinned creature with no fangs and no claws and no poison that you can spit at anybody. And you, you know, and not even a tail to hold on to the branch when you're jumping around in the tree to get away from the leopard. Who, you know, who wants to be like a like a hairless monkey except for your beard? Otherwise, not much hair even. No hair in the throat with a jugular and everything. Not much. So, you know, however, when you were, you, you had many lives in such form. And then you followed it, and then you followed this kind of tiny, you began to have a tiny inkling of empathy. You were like lying like a crocodile at the water hole, and the zebras came, and it was time for your, your bi weekly lunch. And there was a fat pregnant female zebra, and then there was a stringy old zebra, the skinny one, and you, instead of going for the fat female, you sort of remembered when you were filled with crocodile eggs, and you were kind of like, because you're a female, 
And you emphasize subliminally. You couldn't think like, oh, she's a mammal, so she has this, this one big egg in there, you know, I have like hundreds of eggs. You don't think, you have no way of thinking that, because you don't have that kind of language, but you somehow feel a kind of flicker of sympathy for the fat one, even though it looks more delicious. And there's more meat on it. And you just swerve and you grab the old goat, the old nut goat, the, the old goat, the old zebra. And from that little flicker of restraint, self-restraint, that's the beginning of an ethical animal. In other words, not acting to harm another. A little bit or a little less, you're harming someone else, but you at least let that one alone. And how many crocodiles are having such a flicker? Right? Or lionesses, or that you do a mammal to mammal. You know? And then how would you get to be a mammal where you would actually carry the young in your belly for months? The elephant, it's years, I think, right? Poor thing, staggers around. She doesn't want that. Have you ever seen that thing where the, the male elephant chases the female? It's this movie in Thailand. Oh, oh, it's so horrible, it's terrible. They were running away. She doesn't want, she begs, you know, the guy's gonna break her back, she's so scared. She runs away, knocking trees over. He's knocking trees over. <laughs> but neither does my wife, doesn't like me talking about it. It's too funky. <laughs> Anyway, you made a million, zillion such choices as other kinds of animals. We all did. I did too. And finally, we got to be this weird human being. Very vulnerable being, actually. We're clever. We can make like a mechanical crocodile, a nuclear powered crocodile, and go and like destroy it, whatever, because we're clever. But we, we are. The reason we're clever is because we don't eat the people the minute we meet. <laughs> you know, we check. And we listen to them, and then we share ideas, and then we, we listen, and then we were sitting in some cave, the mighty hunter was sitting there cowering because some tiger was outside, and then our, our, our mate was cooking with a little sharpened stick in the fire, and she said, hey, why don't you make a big one like this, idiot? We go and jab that tiger and bring us some meat, it's time to eat, you know? And then we went out and did it, you know, scared out of our wits, but we went out, a bunch of us together, you know? And, uh, you know, but the point is, we're very vulnerable as human beings. And yet, we have this ability of empathy much more strongly. We can identify with another. And then we're mammals also. Even any mammal is already a huge step beyond the egg laying thing, you know, where you dump a bunch of eggs in the sand and then they fend for themselves when they get out and get past the birds and the things, you know, like the mother turtle. But you have thousands of them, so some of them make it. We just have that one. And, uh, and the, the, the higher gender of the different species are the ones who carry that one. The guys are just running around roaring and growling and they don't even know what's going on. <laughs> right? Rocco's laugh. Okay, so the thing is this. If you made it yourself, you're a self-made human being, you know, evolutionarily. And you, you at this middle place, between the divine forms and the subhuman suffering, more suffering forms, but they all have souls, that is mental continua. They all have volition, they, but there's a range of who's more free and less free, and who can make choices. And then the greatness of us as humans is not that we can shoot them all. That's, a, that's in a way, that's, that's descending to the level of dog eat dog, or wolf eat wolf, or whatever. Animal eat animal. <clears throat> what makes us special is that we can become self-conscious and deprogram ourselves, and even deprogram our instincts, and reprogram ourselves to become like identify with all life, actually, and become truly beneficial to life, which is what Buddhahood is. And we can we can consciously accelerate that evolution. And it's very fragile, this human life, and it doesn't last very long. You know that thing where when you die, it splashes before you in a second, a split second, your whole life, all that you ever did. And so it's like, if, if you think about that, maybe it's gonna be 50 years till you die now, or 80, or 20, or 40. It seems like a while, you know? But actually, when you get there, it seems like no time from now. It's like to, to be in the moment, that's it. That's the moment of it, from now to death. When we're in this thing, that's the moment. 
So that's where we start. And then you think about it. So then the other side, theistically, so there's a nice idea we have where we have a spark of God in us. But it's just a spark. And then Dante, right? Beatrice, you know, we get up there, we sing in the choir. And they don't allow you to be God, actually. The Indians do. The Indians allow you to get up to be God, which is kind of nicer, actually. Because they're, they're, they're more generous, more rich, and they're more relaxed. But in the West, in the old ways, you know, nobody gets to be God. But you get to be sort of close by, you know. But this is a case where Buddha discovered that there was, a, you know, a culminatory state of being the mother of all beings, basically. That's what he said. That's, that's written in every text. A Buddha is a being who perceives every other sentient being as a mother, a loving mother, perceives her only beloved child. And then they get all teary-eyed when they say that. <laughs> and if someone's been a mother a few times, then they say, oh my goodness. So then they don't emphasize it there because it's hard work being a mother. How about being a mother of everybody? Being ever worried about everybody like that. That would be a hard job. You'd have to be in another state. You'd have to have a higher bliss level to be able to somehow tolerate such a vast worry compassionate worry that a Buddha does. But the point is, therefore, we as a human are able to understand that, they have language, can, Buddha can talk to us, and we're also not, you know, there's a very funny sutta in the same Diga Nikaya that I read you from, where Buddha goes, as he promised his mother, who passed away soon after he was born and went back to Indra's heaven, like the Olympus, the equivalent of Indian Olympus, you know, where the certain layer of gods live. Not the high, high, highest layer at all, but a very comfortable layer. And uh, he, he promised he would come there and give her a teaching after he was enlightened, when she was upset that he was tormenting himself and thought he would kill himself or die, you know, by not eating food and things. He said, don't worry, mom. You know, she spoke to him from heaven, kind of. He said, don't worry, mom, I'm going to get enlightened. When I do, I'm going to come up and teach you the Abhidharma. Poor thing, he teach you the most boring type of Buddhist teaching you can imagine, of listing all the mental functions and all this and that, <coughs> cosmology and everything. So he goes to that heaven of 33. And then uh, Indra, the king of the gods of that realm, he realizes that this is in Pali, this is not just Mahayana, it's in the, it's in the Theravada thing. And he says to the other gods of the heaven of 33, okay guys, enough partying now. Buddha's coming up here. You're going on retreat with Buddha. You're going to listen and you're going to study and you're going to meditate. And they say, oh, give us a break. We were just about to go have a really great party over so-and-so's house. And like, Why, who cares about that Dharma stuff? You know, like we're gods. You know, like, and, then, and then Indra can't control them. So then he threatens them. He says, oh, listen, Brahma is coming from a much higher heaven. Yeah. Brahma, the creator, but who some people think is the creator, but not the Buddha. So Brahma is coming, and he's going to take the form of a five, five top knot, you know, bodhisattva type of being, and he's going to whip you guys into shape if you don't. And he's going to come like the, the proctor, you know, like the monitor of the class, you know. And so you guys get there and sit and listen to Buddha while he teaches his mother. You know? It's a really funny story. And they're all okay. They're really upset. They can't go to the party that day, and they go and they listen. And then Buddha gives them the truly boring teaching about <laughs> how many mental functions they have, what they, how they work, and all this kind of thing. Yeah. So there's a, that's a cute story in Theravada. So my point is, if you're just a spark of God, but you're a sinner, and all you can do is just believe that someone else is going to save you, and then, you know, hopefully if you go with Dante up and you see Beatrice, then you're happy and you sing in the choir, you and Beatrice, to get holy hands, presumably, in Mark Twain's eternal church social. <laughs> you and she, you and she sit and sing in the choir. That's kind of cool, but you know, in human life, what are you going to do? Just going to be in love with an absolute outside the universe that's supposedly going to take care of you, which may not be that realistic. <clears throat> On the other hand, you're a, you're a mental mechanism, and it's meaningless that you're already nothing. So like, there's no point even in living, actually. Really, according to most scientists, there really isn't. And, you, and also, you're encouraged to be helpless in both cases, actually. And you're encouraged to buy their, buy whatever they're selling you, you know. Because you're, you're told you cannot control yourself. 
You know, when I taught at Emmerich College, we used to have a course that we all taught to freshmen. It was called Darwin, Marx, and Freud. <laughs> and but if and, and, and it extends to a modern person, if you really get Darwin, Marx, and Freud supposedly. But then, what is the upshot of Darwin, Marx, and Freud? All three of them make you professionally helpless. If it's Freud, your unconscious is controls everything you do. You think you make a choice, but you don't. It's your unconscious already made it like ten minutes ago. So you're just a helpless victim of your deeper impulse. There's nothing you can do about it. If you read Darwin, your genes are telling what to do. And if you read Freud, if you read, I'm sorry, Marx, your social status determines how you see things. And, you, and you're totally unfree. You're just a mechanism of your social state, standing. So someone who completely imbibes those three as reality is then meat for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> or whatever it is, just be like Charlie Chaplin in the modern times, you know, like in a real in a industrial factory. You know? there's not, because there's nothing else to do, you're helpless. And that's supposed to be liberal arts and liberated of mind. That is. And then they just let, you know, they, there's something great about liberal arts because the heretic technique can sneak in there and suggest to these kids that they can understand the world. And they don't have to listen to this stuff. They can see what's useful in it. And they don't have to just completely be enslaved by it. And the weird idea, you can actually become conscious of your unconscious. You can actually have free choice. You can actually know what freedom is. You can accelerate that massively and become like really understand your world. You know, that's amazing. That's against all orthodoxies of authoritarian cultures, which all the world cultures have been for the last 3,000 years at least. Mm -hmm. Militaristic authoritarian cultures have all of them. Even the more liberal ones like India, they still are. They still were and still are. So that's where you start. Because if you really appreciate that you yourself work your way up to be a human being, Th parents thank you, they provided your embodiment, but you're not your parents. They didn't make you, in other words. You're not just a combination of your genes. There's a third gene, the spiritual gene, the super soul, the soul gene, you could even call it. And that's you, and that you have, and you chose that form. If you if you're a crocodile dying and being in a crocodile bardo, and you're going, you you somehow in your dream state you wander up and down Fifth Avenue, and you see some lady there who's sort of romantically attracted to somebody. Do you really think you're going to be attracted to being a human being? Can't swim, no scales, no big jaw. I mean, would you really think it's going to be so much fun to be this like weird human being who can't even swim mm -hmm. and has no scales and no teeth? You would not. Don't believe it. It's hard to make a jump like that. Definitely. And you did it, and you only have it for a short time. And if your mind is filled with, you know, eros and thanatos, you know, as Freud claims, we're driven by our lust or by our aggression and fear and hate basically, and it's us versus everybody else, then it's likely we're, we're not going to choose this vulnerable life form that easily. It's not automatic. But I think they a little overemphasize that to make people use their human lives. They say they have some really horrendous simile about how it's real, so rare to recover the human life if you lose it remaining unconscious. If you live through your human life unconsciously, just eating what's in front of you and consuming, getting and spending, you know, eat, drink, and defecate, period, and, and whatever. You're, it's total waste of this amazing achievement that you did as a human being. And it's like, you know, if you go to, you know, some one of these billionaire, trillionaires, and you, you know, Jeff Bezos, just Jeff Bezos feels he has no time because it's any 10 seconds he could lose three billion. So he's like really like every minute is precious to him. He will take a break, etc., because he he reads mindfulness magazines and he knows that there's quality and so on and just want to get too stressed out. But on the other hand, his time is precious because his decisions involve what we measure what value in it in this materialist society, which is money. So we have evolutionary money. We are all evolutionary trillionaires of millions of positive actions that we have done in other life forms and millions of wise intelligence things that we have done even in higher life forms descending to this medium state of the human being and it's incredibly precious 
we could and we could let it go and be end up like Hitler or like the soldier in his army, or we could become a Buddha, a saint or a Buddha. You know, in a single, actually even in a single life. And usually when we sign up for that in the Bodhisattva thing, one's ready to go and evolve for billion lifetimes. But in this esoteric thing, it can be much faster. But but no but no less difficult actually, but just accelerating the difficulty. Do you, do you follow? So that so the point is when you spend your time, what are you doing? Well, I'm waiting for so and so. I'm passing the time. You know, people will say, right? Well, why are you watching that stupid show on TV? Well, I'm just passing the time. You know, I'm going to go on vacation next week, or I'm going to go to work on Monday. So I'm just passing the time. We say it like that. So we're not considering that our time is valuable. But our evolutionary time as a human being is immensely valuable. And that's why when people get that, when they would meet Buddha or throughout the history of Buddhism, they would like, they get in the field of this type of self-awareness of what, what they could achieve as a human being of what the human being is capable of educating themselves to become. They would say, I don't want to waste my time at the office. I don't want to waste my time in the family, I don't want to waste my time in the army. I don't. Want to, I want to like put my mind into lucid dreaming, finding my super subtle soul self. It's the one that goes from life to life, becoming conscious, going to my unconscious, control my instincts. Even not just my surface impulses, but even my instincts. That's what if I can do that. That's what I want to do. I want to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> more and more free. If I was more skillful, I could mute it and sneeze and turn it. <laughs> Sorry. For that noise. And uh, you follow me? So that's the beginning. Is the, our culture does not encourage us to value ourselves. Actually. That's why we'll throw ourselves into the war. Oh, because W wanted to go liberate Iraq or something. Or you liberate the oil and chain you wanted the oil wells there. So we're going to go and be cannon fodder for that because we're patriots. You know, you're not really. That's why they didn't have, they had less wars in Asia after a while. They had them, but less. You know, and then they were vulnerable to the colonialists who came with their cannons and stuff. They invented gunpowder, they didn't use it at all. And that was not an important occupation. Because the human individual was so precious. And the purpose, therefore, of an enlightened society is the flowering of its individuals. Isn't that there's a famous thing in Star Trek, is it? It's one, all for one or one for all. I think that's between Kirk and Spock, they do that. And I think it's Kirk who's the one for all, because you know, he's a patriot, you know, for the Federation. And Spock is all for the one, or vice versa. I can't remember which it is. Maybe it's vice versa, because Kirk is a rebel or something. And he's, doing price shopper or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, right? But the thing is, the, the, the democracy is all for one. That's the greatness of democracy. That's why Churchill said it's the worst of all possible systems of government. Because the whole, the whole is for the flowering of the individual. But that makes it kind of uncontrollable by a boss. You know, it makes it hard to control for a boss. And that's why he said it's the worst. But then he was admitting that the, the bosses are stupid and therefore they manage it badly, so therefore, except for all the others, he said. So he realized he had to deal with it. And that but Buddhist society is like this. The individual has a primary duty to the individual's own amazing human self, which is able which is which is more important than the animals, actually. Not that the animals don't have a soul and are just there to be eaten or to be subjugated, no, or killed. No, they are also going to be humans and they are also doing. But the point is, the human is one of the opportunity to either exterminate all the animals or really bring them, educate them, bring them, accelerate their development beyond the animal by becoming a Buddha. So that's where you begin. If you really value yourself, you will use your time wisely and you will realize that education, and this is, you know, in the five principles of Buddhist society, the third one that I found, I sort of extracted from all many different Buddhist texts in my Inner Revolution book, which was one that I wrote on politics of enlightenment sort of thing. 
But anyway, the third one I had to make up a word for, which I call educationalism, which is sounds awful, I know, but, but, but what that means is that you know we think of education as fitting you for a productive life within the mechanism of the, the collectivist society, whether it considers itself capitalist or communist, it's irrelevant, it's still collective, industrial and collectivist. And, and uh, but if the individual's ability to become a Buddha is their highest duty to, the, to not only themselves, because as a Buddha, they can really be a benefit to other beings, much more than they can as just part of a mechanism, then you, that's the true individualism. That's the real individualism. And that really was born in India. You know, I always used to tell my students, because there was, when I first started teaching, Robert Bella, a famous sociologist, he, would, he had a theory, and he would look at all the world's ideologies and religions, and he would say, oh, only the West has individualism. We're the mighty individualists in the West. All those Asian people and all the tribal people, they just think they're part of a collective. They're caste, or they're this or that. They don't perceive themselves as individuals. He actually thought that, a bunch of racist whiteies. In these, in these great Harvards and things, they actually thought that. They wrote that down to people, oh, he's a great sociologist. That's ridiculous. And I used to tell my students, Michael Burbank heard it when he was a student. And I said, you think you're a rugged individual here in America? Okay. You go strip naked, get a trident, paint some stripes up and down your forehead. I didn't say smoke a chillum, because I would have been arrested. <laughs> Some hashish, you know, I didn't say that. I said, make a hairdo, build up a big hairdo with cow dung, <laughs> and march down Broadway and go to the noodle shop and demand a free lunch <laughs> and see how far you get. And meanwhile, there's 80 million people in India who live like that. And people feed them and honor them, I guess, because there's, even though many of them are pretty funky, they're not really, I think, necessarily. Doing the right yoga, but that's individualism, <laughs> not this like go to college and be pre-med or pre-law or pre or econ major and then go to Goldman Sachs or be a lawyer and then become a senator and a president. No way. That's not individualistic. Okay, so that's where you begin. Then the second thing you do in the beginning is a little less jolly about self-congratulation of I'm a human being. The second thing is really important is you think about death. And you, there's said to be three roots of the meditation on death. Maybe we should meditate that. We can, so I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to just talk all the time. Let's meditate on that. Go into meditative mode. And uh, in meditative mode, you think about your death. And don't freak out, don't be afraid. Well, you might be, it's okay. In a way, you should be. If you're, if you're not fully in control of your unconscious mind, you're not sure what it will do. It's like you, you're, if you're not a lucid dreamer, you've never had a taste of lucid dreaming. If your dream is just like manifesting the unconscious, then you should be afraid. But anyway, think about your death. And then the first route is where you, tend, you sort of repeat to yourself or you try to make vivid to yourself the fact that you're going to die. And when you have meditating on this, your mind will protest. Because it will say, what do you mean? I, I don't have to meditate on this. I know I'm going to die. But then you sort of critically think about how you think about things. And you always procrastinate. You know, I'll do yoga later. I'll do my downward dog tomorrow. I'll really be a yogi after I retire. I will go on retreat, you know, now and then, like next year. I will, you know, you're always assuming. You're living in denial, actually, of the fact that you're going to die. If you really meditate on this strongly, you will come to see that out of a misplaced sense of self-defense, you because actually being, being acknowledging to yourself the immediacy of your death, the immediate possibility of your death, brings you much more to life. So it's actually very 
inspiring, actually, rather than morbidly, you know, like depressing, actually, if you really face it. If you're going to keep it in den by denial and sort of out of sight, but sort of subliminally aware it's going to happen later, that makes you depressed, actually. It's like it sneaks up on you. But if you really look it in the face, you know, when Carl Castaneda's Don Juan used to say, you know, if you take death on as an advisor, then that brings you really alive. Because you really, you, that, that enhances your feeling of the value of being alive immensely. And then the second route, so you do that. So meditate on that for a while. This could be the last talk I'll ever give. <laughs> this could be the last one I'll ever hear. Think about it. To add the second root in. The second root is so that's certain that we'll die. What's uncertain is when. Could be any time. Although it's not going to be here in Menla, I promise. <laughs> but it could be at any time. Then that makes it even more of me to talk about the moment. That makes this moment of being a live human being with my live intelligence intensely valuable. Definitely going to die. It could be any time. As the great Elizabeth Kubler Ross said, one of the pioneers of the hospice movement, she said she'd been with 10,000 people helping them through the death transition. Of course, in her mind, she being a Westerner, she you know she was thinking that I was just this is sliding into the nothing. But anyway, helping them was freaking out about it. But anyway, she said there was I never met. A single person who regretted not having spent another day at the office. Because there's, if you only have a minute, it's going to be quality. If the if your life is a moment, if you're here now in every moment of your life, you're going to be super alive, super aware, super super energized. It could be your last. Super honest with yourself. Super honest and forgiving with others. Seeking their forgiveness. Super empathetic with them. Loving to them. Hoping for their affection and so on. Quality time. You're going to make your time quality for sure. Then the third root is so you're getting these two roots. And this remember is built on you realize how valuable your human form is. Then oops, I'm gonna lose it. Oops, I could lose it any time. <coughs> Third one is when I do lose it, this magnificent embodiment. The only thing I take with me is my super subtle mental continuum. You know, that's we don't write the soul words. For my super subtle soul process, soul <coughs> continuum, if I don't mind, if I'm, if I don't mind it, in which are encoded the results of the way I've acted physically, verbally, and most importantly, mentally. So therefore, the degree of my generosity is encoded there versus my stinginess. The degree of my tolerance and self-restraint, as opposed to my reactivity and anger and paranoia and fear and hatred. The degree of my open-mindedness and realism and being willing to be open to reality, as opposed to my fanatic, closed-minded, this is only how it is, rigid view. Those kind of basic things are encoded there. The degree of my, my creativity as opposed to my passivity. The degree of my ability to focus and concentrate as opposed to my passive distractedness. The degree of my intelligence and penetrating intelligence as opposed to my confusion doubt and mystification, puzzlement. That's encoded in a super subtle plane. 
in that continuum of the of the mind that descends into the clear light and then finds another embodiment or or not depending and finds that embodiment freely out of choice because we we'll wish to convey something to other beings through a body or involuntarily driven by instincts and fear and greed and anger and paranoia and confusion whatever the case so if the ultimate nature of quality time is investing in the soul then one invests in the mind then one is no see that will not seem to be a waste of time to do a meditation practice or to learn something to open one's mind or to be loving as opposed to angry and judgmental or to be generous as opposed to clutchy and open Okay, ding. If you meditate on this, you become not the living dead. The person who lives unconsciously as a robot and a mechanism is the living dead. But uh, the person who has this aware this awarenesses that I just mentioned, the starting place awarenesses, I call it the dying live. So they're aware they're dying at all times but they're bringing themselves fully to life open to open to the new open to the fresh creative constantly growing constantly blooming blossoming making the best out of even the most minute thing you know the, the difference and that's why i love shantideva the great Shantideva, which is a book I recommend to everyone, the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life or the way of the Bodhisattva, there are different translations, there are different titles. And uh, uh, I had a really great title for it, I forgot now what it was. Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva. Engaging in the way of the Bodhisattva and the life of the Bodhisattva. But never mind. But um, he wrote this one thing, he said, in all my future lives, when anybody, as a human or whatever it is, but especially I guess as a human, because you have to have a hand to fulfill his vow to himself. Whenever ever anybody ever asks me for directions, I will never point like this with my index finger. Like it's over there. You want to what the lady's from? You over there. I will never do that. He said, whenever they want to go and they ask me directions, if I know the direction, I will use my whole hand and I will invite them to go there with my hand like this, like an honored guest. I go there and I will reflect that now I'm inviting you to the men's room, the ladies' room. <laughs> but if someday I will invite you to enlightenment, to Buddha, oh. to freedom. Because when I do this, I'm sort of dominating. You know, I'm acting like I know and you don't. I'm putting them down in a subtle way. And when I do this, I'm honoring them, I'm serving them, I'm being their host in life. And to the freedom of life, ultimately, I'm, and I'm rehearsing by that, or, you know, inviting them to to their own reality, to their own freedom. Isn't I think that's so marvelous. I, I'm so in love. With that. So awesome. Because, and that's that's knowledge of emptiness. You know, tiniest little thing. You know, therefore, you know, the, the history history of manners. You know, the monastic community they had special manners. There are, you know, in the precepts of the monks and the nuns, I think there's 18 different types of slurping that you shouldn't do. And these are some of the first onomatopoetic words, you know, like words that sound like what they're describing in the Sanskrit or Pali. And it's, you know, don't do blah, 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 blah. And you can see these people who are living the sensitivity of meditating a lot and being very, very sensitive to each other. And then they get their, they make their food, you know, their brunch, their daily brunch, free brunch. 
and then they go back and sit nearby each other around a tree or wherever they do, and they eat. And then if one of them is like <laughs> doing this, then the other thing. So the deeper you get in emptiness, instead of escaping off into nirvana elsewhere, you become completely concerned with like not eating in a way that disturbs other people. So it's like manners. Didn't George Washington write a book on manners? I think he did. Great leader does that. But those minor things are really critical. You know? So this is the beautiful thing that this biological theory of us being, and this is the real, you know, Oprah, I love Oprah. When she met, uh, encountered, I don't know whether, I don't even know if it was by reading his book or meeting him personally, there was dear Edgar Tola, who was also a friend. When she met him, in Power of Now, you know, yeah. and she got a little bit into the moment, she said, oh, and then she promoted him all over the planet. And she said, oh, being in the moment was like the earth moved, you know. It's like, for real, everything changed in life for me, she said, right? Not this thing about being in the moment. Which was just her belated discovery of Baba Ramdas to be here now, but never mind. It was good. It was great. But I'm saying the one thing that one can find at Menla, one can find from Buddha, which is not Buddhism, but it is the idea that one's self, one's relative self, which one has, one's relative subtle self, which is one's soul, which constantly changes, and which one is responsible for shaping. Doesn't just stay that way because God made it, doesn't stay that way because it's a barcode that Richard Dawkins gave you or Carl Sagan gave you. If you shape it and it changes all the time, and if you don't shape it, it's shaped circumstantially by other things, not necessarily in your interest. And when you realize you are in this great river of life, and you're at a moment of being able to navigate, to develop the power, the knowledge, the ability, to navigate it freely in such a way as to never get in a really bad eddy or swirl or stagnant or poisoned or bad place. And also to even bring others into better places because you, part of being in a better place is to be more connected to others, of course, in a good way, loving them and having them love you back. That's a much better way. And so when you realize you're down, going down this torrent of life forms with no end in sight. They're all swirling around with infinite numbers of other beings. And never mind you have hundreds around you. You get serious about swimming well, navigating well, gaining the tools with which paddling well, getting the canoe, getting the vehicle, getting the boat, the steamer, whatever it is, you get really serious about it. And it doesn't seem like a weird thing or a waste of time or effort. You know? And in fact, it becomes so much of an occupation, like the great Tibetan St. Francis of Tibet, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, the Tukulun guy in Tibet, approximately the same century, called Nila Repa. He said, someone who has idea of what the Dharma is to a human being, you know, the Dharma just meaning, you know, teaching about the nature of reality. You know, method of discovering what is real, what you are really, and what the world is to you. That's really what's real. Buddhism is not a religion. Buddhism is simply realism. Deciding you're going to get real, and you and you're going to find what is real. That's really what it is. Doesn't matter. You know. If you live in a certain culture, whatever, with a family and a grandma or a certain religion, then keep it. That's Dalai Lama really means that. He's not just making a sort of cute thing and really he thinks everybody should be Buddhist. No way. He thinks everybody should be real. And they, part of being real is being good with who you're associated with. And in that case, don't upset grandma by jumping off into some weird thing, what she thinks is a weird thing. Just be more real and she'll be really happy. And if you go to synagogue or church or temple or to the secular theater or whatever, with her, she'll be happy. And you go there in a more generous, more tolerant, more cheerful and happy way, she'll be happy.
So the, the, this biological view, and of course it's not absolute, it's not dogma, it's just a useful way of, it's a scientifically useful, and remember scientific theory has to have simplicity, has to be corroborated by evidence, it has to be elegant also. And actually it, it's good if it has a good implication. And the implication of this, how do you shape your spiritual gene, your soul gene, your super subtle mental gene? How, how do you shape it? Well, look at, look at the possibilities in life. The worst way of living in life is deepening your sense of isolation and alienation. Hell is the supreme isolation. It's like you're in a little, you get into an iron fort and your walls are blocking, but you're also imprisoned in there. And maybe the walls will crush in on you, you know. But the point is that no one else can bother you. It's like supreme level where paranoia will take you, you know. Live by the sword, die by the sword, you know. Then you're in a forest of swords, you know. It ends up because there are more other swords that come and get you. you know? So they, but they, but they describe it in such a vivid way. All the thirty-two hells. It's just too much. I'm not going to get into it. But I'm just saying, obviously, the worst form of life is the more isolated you are from others, the more barriers between you and others, the more alienated you feel. And the best form of life is where you are all the others, and they are you, and you're like they're like your child. You know, they're just part of you, and you're part of them. Which is, of course, inconceivable that you could feel you are everybody. Like right here and now in this room, if you suddenly felt you were every single person in the room, that's kind of inconceivable. Like which which perspective is preferable? You know, because from everyone thinking something different, they they think they're in a different place. They identify with themselves in a different body with a bunch of different senses. And suddenly, you will feel all of that. You're aware of all of that. And then this is to a cosmic level. Enlightenment, apparently, it's, it's, by, it's a definition, I, and I hope it's true. And apparently, you can bear it because it's blissful. You perceive others as really being blissful, even though they think they're miserable. But you see them as, as a deeper way they actually are. Simultaneously, that you don't ignore that they don't see themselves that way. So you you're there to help provide them with whatever mirror it needs to reflect to that to them their deeper blissful self, actually. So. So that's the gamut of expanding to be all life, to feel identified with all life, or to take your life and think it as isolated as possible. So that's the worst possible way and the best possible way, because you can see that theoretically. Then killing physically, taking, depriving another of their life, that is depriving another continuum, you know, soul, subtle, subtle mind continuum, if you want to use the Theravada expression, or soul. If you want to use another expression, you know, depriving them of that embodiment that they have, especially humans, which they they themselves have earned over aeons of past lives. And they have made won their way to this amazingly sensitive and vulnerable form, an intelligent form. You are saying that piece of life is not connected to me. I'm separate from that. So I can take that life. So you're on that's a step toward isolating yourself by just not identifying with that life. You save a life on the other hand, you know, that all these cultures have, you know, you save someone's life, then that person, you know, you know, Tonto follows you forever because you saved his life. All these samurai movies, you know, oh, you saved my life, I saved your life, oh, I'm, you're a different man than me, but I, you saved my life, I saved your life. And then, so you kind of belong to the person who saved your life, and you take responsibility for the person whose life you saved. So the two of your lives kind of join at least to that extent. Even though you still think you're not enlightened, so you still think you're separate bodies, blah, 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 over there and over here. But you actually saved their life, so you, that's identifying with them. So that's expanding you toward this infinite identification, right? Limitless identification. Did you get it? Yeah. You take their property that they didn't give you. Then you're ignoring their sense of possession. As opposed to you give something, then you're sharing your sense of possession with them and enjoying them possessing what you enjoy. So those are again identifying, expanding your identification. And then the saddest one, these are the three physical in how to navigate evolution. Because you see it, not just as ethical rules. That's why Sharon was amusedly and humorously saying that I don't like right and wrong. I like realistic and unrealistic with these ethical things. Because 
this is reality that this kind of action makes you bigger and better and more more expands your sense of identity and your sense of what kind of life you belong with and the other one contracts it and therefore they're really being being nice is realistic it's not just self-sacrifice in any way it's being realistic so so that's why i prefer that so because i think it's amazing it's marvelous it gives you a reason and it doesn't matter about you know there's a self set there's a selfish reason for being altruistic and being ethical that's good if that's the case you know they have arguments psychologists say no true altruism unless people get something out of being altruistic well no that's okay that's a that's like a quibble terminological quibble if the fact is if you get a benefit out of being better to others that makes you stronger and motivated to be better to others so that's fine that intensifies your altruism and as I said, the third one, the third physical one is sexuality. Sexuality is where, as a marvelous human being, you have this wonderful access, even following your instincts, because your instincts are already tempered as a human being. It isn't just complete, you know, no foreplay procreation. <laughs> it's like much more sensitive. And it's a time when you can melt and at least identify with one other being at least for a while without any kind of idea of anything. You know, it just sort of naturally happens. And to use that sort of thing, which is one of the benefits of the human being, one of the, one of the learning places of the human being, to be abusive to someone and to harm them, either socially by breaking up their family or doing something, or even physically, you know, by becoming sadistic or brutal or whatever. You know, so it's real, they, they, you'll read in books, it's called adultery or not adultery, but that's only in monogamous societies because that can be harmful to someone. It isn't really that, it's, it's basically it's a harmful sexual engagement versus beneficial sexual engagement. And that's defined in different ways in different cultures. But basically it's loving. It's when you actually, loving in the real sense of loving, not just greedily grabbing, but loving in the sense of wishing the happiness of the beloved. Your, your main job in there is the other be happy, you know? So then you have two who are making each other happy. That's what the ideal thing. That's Romeo and Juliet, of course, and then everybody else hates them. <laughs> <laughs> they can't stand it. Yeah, what about me? <laughs> but the point is, that's a, that's a marvelous thing. And isn't that marvelous for other animals? Check it out. And then, and I won't go there, and then I get mad at it. I do. But believe me, that elephant will be through hell. You really don't aspire to, to some elephant, el elephant play. You know. It's not really foreplay. Foreplay with tree trunks. <laughs> so, so, so then that's a, that's a physical one. Then verbal one. You lie to someone. You're creating a false reality in which you're entrapping them instead of sharing reality with them, or whatever you think it is, and you may not fully know it, but at least when you tell the truth, you're, what you think is the truth, you're sharing reality with them, so you're uniting with them in some way. Speech where you divide others from each other, you create conflict between others, you know, slanderous or backbiting type of speech, versus diplomatic, peacemaking, reconciling speech. You know, people do that with each other, so I'm gonna be your good friend, because that other one isn't your good friend. They know good, you know, so then you think you're bringing them closer, but actually, you harming them by making them lose another friend. Mm -hmm. Instead of reconciling those two, then both will be your friend, actually. So then you're expanding to both of them. Speaking harshly to them and using speech as a bludgeon on them is harming them, and speaking sweetly, singing, whatever, you know, healingly, it's a, those, those are uniting versus separating. And finally, speaking meaningless, babbling meaninglessly versus meaningfully, mm -hmm. Accepting the privilege of being heard by someone and doing something that benefits them by giving them a deeper sense of understanding of, of some knowledge that they could be used, something that they could that help them. Those are those are the equivalent in the in the Western thing of blasphemy. So it's just blasphemy is speaking stupidly to other beings, meaningless babble. It isn't necessarily only gossip. It's just meaningless babble, pretending to know something that you don't and misleading them. So those are four of speech, again, moving towards separation, moving towards unity. And then mind is same, a, a, you know, malicious mind versus a loving mind, greedy, covetous mind versus a generous mind, and finally, closed, fanatic mind that I know what is right, I know what is real, I know everything, 
versus being open-minded and being realistic about life and, and accepting its causal, fluid, changing, insecure process and trying to make the best of navigating that. So those are the 10 different, it's called the 10 fold path of evolutionary action, positive and negative evolutionary action. It's so brilliant, I think, personally. I really do. Imagine, it's like, it's like biology connects to ethics in that kind of a culture. So that one, one can therefore internalize an ethical code without some police enforcing it because it makes you, it's good for you as well as others. It's truly win-win, it's really great, I think. Karma, and that's what karma means. And it wasn't automatic like that, doesn't mean fate. It means the causal process by which you design your soul and you prepare your navigation through life and through in the infinite ocean of life, which you are stuck in actually, by, by emptiness, infinite relativity, you are stuck in that. I think it's wonderful, don't you think it's wonderful? Yeah. I mean, it's like Michel Alexander, that woman who wrote that op-ed, you know, if people thought that way, then they wouldn't want to wreck the planet for their grandchildren by burning up, by selling a bunch of oil. Or, and even to the degree of, I cannot understand the people like the Koch brothers, the owners of refineries and things like that, you know, that they would, that they, that they don't, they have all this cash, you know, billions. They still spend tens of billions a year, hundreds of billions a year finding more crappy oil and coal, even that tar sand stuff is like really, ridiculously create such a mess, you know, and it's so little that they get out of it. But just to keep the same way they're going, stuck on the rut that they're in, instead of investing in alternative and being the kings of the alternative world, because they have that investment ability. If they just took the money they used for exploring more, what is it called? Captured assets, it's, it's a word for it. It's, uh, you know, unusable assets. Just because you put their stock price up. And they're already millionaires and billionaires. It's so crazy. But they could be like they could they could rule the world of uh, of um, uh, you know solar panels. They have solar panel sweatshops. They have a solar panel vest they can make. Go around and charge up. <laughs> solar panel to figure it out. Running my the iPhone once I put it in my head. We're <laughs> <laughs> all cyborgs. No, 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 no. So those are the those things. If you if you, the starting point is there, and if you if you think of these themes, you know, preciousness of my human life, endowed with liberty and opportunity, and my human intelligence, and my human heart, loving heart. Immediacy of death, that it's not there forever, and that for every moment I have it and I am it, it's really worth zillions, and I should make the most of it and make it meaningful, let's say. And then making every bit of life a meditation, a positive development, gesturing like that for someone, and making them feel honored in some way, you know, from the body language, you know, becoming conscious of my body language. And so forth, and and and, and, and uh, so little teeny things, uh, you know, creating a new culture, creating new shapes within culture, new manners and shapes within whatever culture, making it more gracious for others, you know, and fulfilling the dream of Confucius and of Buddha. And it's a beautiful book by Herbert Pingaret about Confucius called this Confucius: The Secular and Sacred. Really beautiful book. He was not a sinologist, but he, he it's quite beautiful how Confucius took, and same thing a Buddha did. Karma meant ritual action in a ritual that affected your fate because the gods were controlling you. And so you pleased them and you, you bribed them to control you in a nice way. And he took that karma word and he said, no, that's how you personally behave. That's, that's the ritual, it's the ritual of life. The ritual of being harmonious with everyone in life and educating yourself to embrace more and more of everyone. Systematically, because you just telling you you must do it is not enough. The people can't necessarily obey that and they get discouraged. 
You have to learn how to use the tools of your body, speech, and mind to always be positive, which you can do. That's what the human being can do. Right? Okay, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a comment. I'm here. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Yes. Um, I have a comment, and I would like to hear your response to you have a comment. You have a comment. Okay. So, what you were talking about about the gesturing of the hands, for example, yeah reminded me of uh, a recent time I just brought my kids down to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. And we had this experience of going through there. And at the end, there's a movie um, with survivors talking about their experience. And this woman was saying that when she was brought to the concentration camp, and she smelled the burning flesh mm -hmm. of other people. Mm -hmm. She said, what it did to me is I didn't feel like a human anymore. I felt like an animal. Uh -huh. And she said, I said to myself, even with this, I'm still hungry and I still want to survive. Mm -hmm. And I'm just living on this animal level but I know that I want to survive. Uh -huh. So she went through all of that. And then she said that when the liberation happened, this American soldier came in and he, she was outside and he asked her to, they needed to go into a factory for him to see what was going on inside. And she said, there was one moment he, he opened the door for me and he let me go in front of him. And she said that one act of him opening the door, uh -huh. I felt like I became human again. That's lovely. That's nice. So that reminded me of that. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Yes. Great. Yes, thank you. And I know that uh, Nana doesn't want you to talk about this, so you'll have to tread carefully. But in the physical um, uh, realm of the tenfold path yes. of evolution, uh -huh. evolutionary, well, evolutionary action, action which is how I right? Mm -hmm. So the third in the realm of the physical, which sounds like it's uh, a sexual union, which I, of course, in the most blissful way, let's say, uh, also then can can produce children that raise well, can be of benefit to, you know, I mean, there's a, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'm just wondering about, um, uh, what am I wondering about? I guess, uh, how, I guess, I guess, just maybe I'm think, I just keep thinking about trauma and recovery from trauma, or how um, I, I'm rereading "Open to Desire" by Mark Epstein and renunciation, and just thinking about um, I don't know. I guess forms of vulnerability that aren't just about the jugular, and how we work with all of that uh, too. And maybe there's nothing to say. But um, that's what I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't quite understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something about in terms of conduct, and, and I know in terms of the the um, the Thich Nhat Hanh that he teaches that, which I follow follow, I guess. But um, I haven't heard this box sharing this before. So, so can can you translate it, those? Um, first of all, Nana is, just doesn't want to talk about the, like elephant sex. Not oh, okay. Sex. <laughs> I don't know. Um, she's, I think I don't she's, want to hear about it. she's asking, um, how do you reconcile the um, the like renunciation as a as a part of the Buddhist path and uh, healthy sexual 
um, activity or creativity. So they appear well, to, to contribute. I did a radio show this morning, and uh, I, it occurred to me in, a, in that show, I, I ended up going, going toward Wilhelm Reich, who was one of my heroes, uh, was in the youth and still remains so. And, uh, and then I, I realized that, you know, people think, you know, the function of the orgasm, right, Wilhelm Reich. But actually, Wilhelm Reich's concept of the function of the orgasm is essential. And his whole theory of the emotional plague, which is what, what our rulers, current rulers, are afflicted with. You know? And the, the emotional armory, the emotional plague, has this great chapter called the emotional plague and the murder of Christ. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's European. Yeah. And it's wonderful. But what I realized, what I, what I, what I came to be is that actually the mendicant, female or male mendicant, doesn't because they are not having genitally organized sexual encounters because they have a vow of celibacy. That's actually important. And then true orgasmic bliss, as Reich defined it, is not actually does does not require, and even it can be short circuited by genitally organized what he called armored sex. Because uh, sometimes, you know, the actual orgasm can happen to a person who's involved with the genital organization to some extent. But the real thing, his orgasm thing was where there's a dyad of a couple, and uh, then they don't get into the huffing and puffing routine necessarily, and they're just together. And then the, a blue wave of orgone energy will pick them both up and make them sort of let go of themselves. Which will which 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 is actually tantric, and he didn't know there was such a thing, which was very interesting at that time in Europe or in America or whatever else in the fifties, in the sense that it's orgasm of the throat chakra, of the heart chakra, of the of the navel chakra, of the brain chakra, you know that is sought. You know, I think people who are yoga teachers know about this, and they refer to it as the orgasm. <laughs> which I think are a little, uh, or then Kundalini yoga people, this sort of a very powerful experience in the in the central nervous system of a different kind. And then the Buddhist Tantra, of course, has this very explicitly worked out. And, um, and, uh, and therefore, they consider that being celibate enables more powerful orgasmic, in the right in sense, unarmored, melting of the self-controlled structure you know, and melting into the universe in a deeper, more powerful way. Whereas the genitally organized one, which is based on a person whose internal streaming, as he would call it, is very constricted by posture, by trauma being embedded in their muscular armature and neural armature. And, you know, he describes military posture beautifully like this, mm. where they want to cut off sensitivity so they won't feel their own fear, so they won't be sensitive to the suffering of their enemy. They draw the pelvis back like that. They stuck the chin down on the neck and choke up themselves here, and they draw the diaphragm in by sucking in the belly so that the diaphragm is constricted. Therefore, they can't have streaming up and down the central nervous system. And then the emotional plague, as he defines it, is someone who is in like that is very, very frustrated, of course, because they never get any real, even they have, you know, genital ejaculation, ejaculatory type of, you know, quickies. It doesn't really sweep them away, and then they want more because they didn't really get carried away by it which was his brilliant analysis. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they get so used to being controlling themselves that way and controlling everything, and they think that's their armor of controlling. And, so, and they're sort of militarized posture. And even if they're not in the military, they're in a police type state and they're beaten up by their parents and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then, uh, then they meet someone who has streaming, and that's why he calls murder of Christ, like a holy person, like someone who's inner, who has a field of streaming. And who, by being around, people feel better because they somehow begin to feel their own inner bliss, actually, which everyone has. In fact, it's what is one, it's the health and the life force of people. And then, but then they feel frightened by it because it, it, it makes them resonate in their field. And they feel, oh, I'm going to melt, I'm going to be in my pants, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be a good soldier, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then they go and strangle the person who uh, they subliminally realize is radiating that field. Mm -hmm. That's the murder of Christ. So brilliant. So it isn't necessarily connected to what we normally think of as sexuality. And therefore, you can have a guy like a certain person, like number individual number one, 
in the Robert Mueller case, who's a huge pussy grabber, because he never gets his own pussy going. <laughs> he had never had his whole life. He's going like this, you know, and he doesn't have the streaming in himself. You follow me? And so he just constantly grabs and grabs and has some external, seemingly symbolic something, but actually has no, and therefore he has, he has like these uh, people who, who I, I, I won't get to, I'll, uh, my friend will be upset if I go to go on. But the point is, he, because of his own, that's why one can feel sorry for him, even though if you go streaming around him, he might strangle you. But nevertheless, he's, because he's deprived of that melting feeling that is contacting his own vital energy. But actually, he has a good karma in a way because he's so strangulated. By the way, he was thrown up from the trauma embedded in his body. And also all the harm he's done to so many people. I'm not paying them, doing this, that. You know, I hate to think, you know, of the different harms that he's done, you know, to people. That therefore this feeds back on him by more and more cramping his being, more and more isolating himself, creating more and more a hellish existence. You could be in a gold plated penthouse, triplex, and be miserable, as you know, and frustrated. And, oh, that's terrible. What am I do? Oh, I'll go kill Obama. Oh, I'll be president. Oh, I'll make my name. I'll build more buildings. Oh, I'll go pee in the Kremlin. <laughs> I mean, you know. But none of them would be satisfied, is the thing. He's not happy. I, I always had a dream. If I, if I had billions, I would definitely buy an island in Bahamas or someplace a little bit. There's too many, maybe typhoons there. Someplace where it's sort of semi-tropical and not too bad of type of storm or earthquake thing, and create like a fantasy island for ex-dictators. <laughs> and really make a great program there and you know have like great massage therapists have middle on cell levels massage therapists great food you know beautiful films and movies and whatever's needed you know and uh, and uh, Japanese robots you know I, I wouldn't hire her so it's kind of sex trade for 600,000 people that are trafficked around the world today I wouldn't put that on that island but Good massage therapists, and then maybe some plastic dolls, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever they need to finally unblock their thing that makes them intolerant of people being happy and frightened of people being happy, which is the that's a right and brilliant genius thing, you know. And um, and the Buddhist Buddha thing, you know, uh, the, the the people can't get that; they freak out. These monks are there, you know, because we have this idea, oh, you've got to have a lot of sex to be happy, but you can have a lot of sex and be even more miserable and make all your partners miserable. Definitely. You know, armored sex, what he calls, you know. You know? So celibacy actually is a way of backing that up into the central nervous system. And if you know, if you know the yoga of doing that, that's really far out, you know. And these yamyo, male-female figures, you know, in union, they're really not trying to procreate. You know, they're not necessarily huffing and puffing. They have like, it's very interesting. They are, they're locking two sets of chakras in a balanced state and they're, 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 they're liberating, they're turning, they, they, like Tantra, you know, they're turning the addictive emotion of anger, which is into the ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom, which is blue in color, just like orgone energy, like Wilhelm Reich said, said it was blue, dark, deep blue, color of medicine Buddha. The blue color, the deep blue sapphire color, is the color of hatred turned into realizing the perfection of the universe, which means that they're using this balanced thing of the, of the humanoid-like coarse body to create a space where they're okay in, in there, and yet they're ready to give their body away. So they're staying alive by you in union with each other. And, and, and yet they're just as well let themselves go in the, the grand ball, the great death of enlightenment. It's really a beautiful thing. But it doesn't involve necessarily being a lay person. The celibacy is actually a step toward that. Therefore, for example, in Kala Chakra, some tantras, you have to resign as a monk to practice the higher levels because you do need something. But like Kala Chakra, the, the very highest of highest initiations is only given to what they call a bhikshu vajradhara, a celibate vajradhara. And, uh, and the lay people can't reach that highest one. 
thing, especially for chakras, which is the most explicit of them. So it's not really addressing. So therefore, all those incarnations, you know, those tulkus and tulkus, the ones who had because of the they were no longer monks because they were out there behaving like they behave in the world, you know, teaching Dharma and doing some good, but they don't allow them to that deepest initiation. Only the ones who are still monks. Or nuns. Mm -hmm. Not so much nuns, you can say. Nuns are not so well educated, although Dharma was trying to fix that. Now we do have some nun geishas and we have some non uh, non Vajracharyas, I hope. Okay? So it's five forty five. So it takes a little time to walk down to the to the weather carefully. I think it's above freezing, but there may be ice, I don't know, at this time of day. So have a leisurely stroll. Anybody wants a ride, I have an empty back seat. And I will be pottering down to dinner. And uh, I'm so happy to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I was learned, you see. Thank you. I was learned when uh, when there are people with open minds and are interested. And they want to be more part of the larger life. I was learning a lot because, you know, from having to talk to them. And I learned stuff. <laughs>